This is Free to Exchange, the show where free thinking scholars, free markets, and, ironically, free public television all meet. I'm your host, Ben Powell. Today's episode, like many others, is about how freedom grows or recedes. On the first half of the show, we're going to talk to the greatest champion of freedom to hold a congressional seat in my lifetime, Dr. Ron Paul. On the second half of the show, we'll explore the role that rock and roll music played in spreading ideas behind the Iron Curtain and how that contributed to the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Without further ado, joining me now is former congressman and three-time presidential candidate, Dr. Ron Paul. Ron, welcome to Lubbock, Texas Tech, and the Free Market Institute. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. So, can you start just by telling us a little bit, I mean, you've been known as a champion of liberty in particular, economic liberties in Congress, which is something quite foreign to the other 434 <laughs> of them in there. Uh, how did you come to hold free market ideas? Well, it, it came about through an evolutionary change. Um, you know, I figured that some of the things I learned about economics in college and high school and through TV and everything else, I had to unlearn it. Mm. <laughs> and uh, during the 60s, uh, matter of fact, maybe earlier than that, I came across Hayek's book, Road to Serfdom, and he, he stimulated me and started me. Then I got into Mises and got to know Rothbard. Matter of fact, I heard uh, Mises lecture and had dinner with Hayek. So uh, I got to know people personally, but I was just enthralled with the difference between what the Austrian school was teaching versus the conventional uh, economics. And when, when I realized that those computers were worthless, you know, they, oh, we'll just put these numbers in here and we can predict exactly what's going to happen to the economy like they're doing all the time. When I discovered that, I was really excited because it was personal choices and there was a variable in there that was very important and it was based on a moral concept of liberty and property. That, that made me very excited, so I pursued that and, uh, and continued to try to ex be able to explain it. I think this is an important point because a lot of people, I think the, the morality of liberty and property resonates with a little bit, but they don't understand this kind of coordination that occurs that you learn through Austrian economics then. Yeah, I think, I, I think uh, if you don't do that, then you, you don't hold on to it. I think there is a moral principle. And of course, the basic moral principle of a free society is that uh, you can't hurt other people you know, in economics or in social issues that uh, you have voluntary choices, but it's also built on the concept of property. If you have property and voluntary choices, and then you have uh, a strict understanding of what would the role of government be under those circumstances, all of a sudden the world changes completely. You have a different monetary policy, you have a different foreign policy, and uh, you look differently at individuals with their personal lifestyles. And you don't have to accept uh, violence Violence, you're not tolerant of violence, but otherwise you're tolerant of people, how they spend their money and how they run their lives and what religion they have. So to me, it, it is a concept where a major part of that, if you care about the middle class and you mm -hmm. care about uh, people doing well economically, uh, then you're going to accept these principles rather than saying, what we need is more government, more printing of money and, and more redistribution, which we hear constantly. This is a different approach and uh, something people should be excited about. and. Uh, I, I talk to a lot of young people, and I find they can get excited about this issue. Yeah, no, I think it's, this is unique for you in Congress relative to the rest of, of not distinguishing between private violence and government violence when government transfers property or regulates what one can do. But it leads me to wonder how you survived in Congress. I mean, H.L. Mencken, right, he said that an election was an advanced auction <laughs> on stolen goods. But this tells me, you know, in democratic politics, if you're not hawking something for the people who are bidding, how do, you, how do you get elected and survive well, in Congress? It came to me naturally. I can't describe how it is, but I do know one thing from the very first time I ran for office was way back in 74, and, the, and then I was in office for a good many years off and on. It, it seemed like every year I was much more skeptical and more critical of the government. There was never any temptation whatsoever for me to say, you know, I need to go along to get along. I need a bill passed and this sort of thing. But for me, it was always an intellectual uh, pursuit for me and uh, figuring people say, well, you never get anything done. You never get any bills passed. You know, I said, well, maybe, uh, maybe I'd like to have some influence in a different way, but uh, political power and influence and, and having a bill passed, what good's having a bill passed just to have your name on it? it there was no appeal to me, but there was a lot of it. I just felt like it was a natural thing, but it kept building. But the most, most people say, well, how did you manage to stay there 
and not join the gang. Well, for some reason, the longer I was there, the more skeptical I got about government. So let's take one of the areas where you've been way out on, on the lead on, and this is sound money and monetary policy. Tell us a little bit about your views on that and how it differs from well, virtually everybody else in Washington. Well, uh, this, this had to do with me being involved in the 60s and studying Austrian economics and reading those individuals who were already Austrian economists predicting, you know, the Bretton Woods is going to break down. And I, oh, I better know about the Bretton Woods. It's going to break down and this $35 an ounce and this, uh, you know, gold price is not going to work. And sure enough, in 1971, I remember the day explicitly, August 15th, a Sunday night, Nixon gets on the air and he announces that, uh, you know, no more uh, gold standard, uh, close the gold window, put on a huge tariff on this. And it was, it was terrible. And yet the next day, the stock markets loved it. The Chamber of Commerce <laughs> loved it. And I, th I thought, well, this was just terrible, terrible. It turned out the 70s turned out very terrible, too. I think I was right for the 70s. But a lot of people thought this, this was wonderful and uh, the immediate reaction. So I became fascinated with monetary policy. And it's very easy to intertwine uh, monetary policy with everything in economics practically because uh, if, if you think about it, the monetary unit is one half of every single transaction. So therefore, it's very, very much involved. And if somebody's manipulating and distorting it and distorting interest rates, they're messing up the whole economy. And lo and behold, here we are on the doorstep of uh, not just our economy, but because of the uh, recklessness of us being able to issue the reserve currency in the world, we were able to export many of the mistakes and they're just coming back. Matter of fact, right now we're hearing stories that foreign governments are starting to sell our treasury bills. And if that gets rolling, you won't need the Fed to tighten credit to raise the interest rate. So monetary policy is fascinating. Of course, uh, Austrian economics teaches that uh, you shouldn't ever give that power to a couple of individuals to create money out of thin air. Yeah, you know, I think this is a really important and, and subtle point that you were making there, too, of how it's not just the aggregate rate of inflation, but this money's part of all transactions. So as it ripples through, it just distorts everybody's decision making. Every, every single thing. So if you could have your way then, so forget what's politically possible. Just if you could have your way, what monetary system do you think would produce a more sound money? I, I'd let the market decide it and uh, have certain basic rules that our government doesn't follow uh, that you couldn't counterfeit, you couldn't defraud. But our system is based on counterfeiting. And I keep thinking about what the founders thought about counterfeiters you know, in 1792. Yeah. So essentially, you're just allowed competition and markets yeah, competition. like anything? Yeah, competition. And I don't think, and... I mean, what, what if you and I set up a company and say, we're going to print the money. And, I like uh, it, but and I don't know we'll, if And if you need more, we'll print more. Would that, uh, you know, instill trust in the money? No. They would want something more. And if, uh, if we wanted to have a sound currency, we could issue, pe some people think if you have uh, a uh, precious metal commodity money, that you have to j carry all those coins. But no, you just have to uh, know that your substitutes uh, are redeemable. And, uh, and, and uh, that's why I, f I favor a gold coin standard. So uh, yeah, it would happen. It could, it could be gold and silver, I think. And I don't like to, pe people say, oh, you wanna go back to those dark ages of the gold standard. No, I wanna get it. I think there's a better gold standard because I don't think in our early history, we had a perfect gold standard. You know, we had a silver standard, gold standard, bimetallism, we went off it again. And, and maybe we wouldn't uh, go off, uh, if it's more private decided, maybe we, we wouldn't have the government be able to go off the standard because they always go off the standard for runaway welfareism and warfareism. So let's, Take that point on runaway welfareism for, for just a moment here too then. So what do you think about the future of government spending? If we've seen regular on budget spending going up, but we also see this ballooning entitlement bomb coming. Where are we headed with that? And is there going to be any political will to stop us before we hit a crisis? No, there's no way. Uh, that's one thing I learned in Congress. You're not going to have enough new people elected that believe like we believe. And it, that's not going to happen. They're not going to back off, but it's going to end. And it won't end with the nominal numbers going down. It's going to end. The liquidation has to come, you know, the distortions and the prices and, and this debt. It gets liquidated. Uh, they can't stop it. They can't pay it off. 
and it's, and it's not going to be liquidated uh, by us working hard and paying it off. It'll be liquidated uh, by what they're just praying for right now by the Fed is if we could only get inflation going, if we could only destroy the value of the money faster. Because, you know, if you double the rate of inflation, uh, you know, uh, you liquidate a lot of debt, which we've been able to get away on the sequences over these years, but we're past that now. But eventually, that is what will happen uh, when, when the foreigners quit taking our money and they start dumping that currency more. They will print more money because they will not cut back on Social Security. They're not going to cut back on food stamps. They're not going to cut back on the military industrial complex. They're going to keep spending. It'll be the rejection of the confidence in the money. And then it'll be liquidated. And then the ball game is over. And that'll be the big bust. And then the, we, or another clo uh, generation that's approaching, will have to deal with this. And they'll have to decide what the role of government should be. And they're going to have to decide something about monetary policy. So you think this might be the opportunity for change that we haven't had is when the crisis strikes? Oh yeah, I think, uh, I think it's a wonderful time to offer ideas up because of the necessity. Uh, you know, I think I see total failure in our foreign adventurism. I see total failure in monetary policy and spending policy. And all, all that is advised is, uh, you know, well, we print a lot of money, it hasn't worked. It's Congress's fault they haven't spent enough money. Mm -hmm. You know, it goes on and on. So it's a failed system and they can't rescue it. So we who believe in freedom and free markets and property rights, we have a wonderful opportunity to present our case because that will make the difference. And I think, uh, I think we have a fair chance at that uh, just because uh, uh, there are people who are coming up with free market think tanks, not think tanks now that I think are fantastic like yours because I think the mood is changing. I talked to a lot of young people and they're open to the ideas. But I love it because young people approach it because they like the idea of it being a principled moral issue. And economics is and should be rather than just management. Uh, they're always talking about, well, we need to, what, what should the Fed do today? Raise the interest rates up, lower the interest rate. They, all they want to do is Mickey Mouse around and manage things. And uh, we, we don't need that. We, we need to have a system that manages itself. And, uh, but I think people are going to be open to it because of the failure of this system. This, uh, this economic system is, cannot last, and it's just a matter of time. Well, we here on this show certainly agree it's all about the ideas and the spread and discussion of these valuable points. And you've done so much to introduce young people to it in the last decade or so. Uh, greatly appreciate what you've done and for joining us here on the show today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Free to Exchange is a joint project of Texas Tech's Free Market Institute and Texas Tech Public Media. More information is available at fmi.ttu.edu. Welcome back. Joining me now is Professor Larry Swikert. Dr. Swikert is a professor of history at the University of Dayton. He's the author of the New York Times bestseller, A Patriot's History of the United States. And he's also a former rock and roll drummer whose bands were the opening act for Steppenwolf, The James Game, and Mother's Finest, among others. In combining his talents, he's produced a documentary, Rockin' the Wall, that explains how rock and roll music spread ideas of freedom behind the Iron Curtain. Larry, welcome to Texas Tech and, and to the show. Thanks, I'd love to be here in Lubbock. Well, let's start with just actually before we get to the Iron Curtain, rock and roll music more generally. Is some you know, forms of music are more state subsidized than others. Is, is rock and roll a, a free market phenomenon? Rock and roll is the most free market music ever. I it, knew I liked it for it, a reason. It, it grew up you know, mostly out of uh, uh, blues bars and out of garages from young kids. Uh, they were never subsidized by National Endowment for the Arts, National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, quite the contrary, there are often ordinances in cities where you couldn't play rock and roll, and often churches tried to have them, uh, you know, records burned or whatnot. So it's a very free market music, and it, and it comes from the ground up the way almost all good things do. So this is just a free market phenomenon in terms of there were people who wanted to produce it, others who wanted to consume it, and people tried to even get in their way and couldn't stop it. That's right, and more so, obviously, in the communist countries than here. Sure. So let's talk about that. How does a form of music spread ideas of freedom? Well, already in the Cold War, the U.S. government had the idea of beaming music, mostly classical music, Brahms, uh, Beethoven, Rachmaninoff, into the Iron, country, Iron Curtain countries. And they would intersperse this music with news reports or some propaganda. Well, sometime in the 70s, 
uh, but maybe even some in the late 60s, uh, the government agencies began discussing, you know, maybe we should be sending rock and roll in there as well. And there was a, there was a big battle within the, uh, the administrations, not just one, but several. It continued all the way up to Reagan. And, and there were those who said, rock and roll's degenerate. We don't want to be shipping this horrible music over to these people. But there were other people who argued, you know, rock and roll is essentially a music about freedom. Now, they didn't make this argument, but they intuitively understood something about rock and roll, which is that rock and roll is is uh, perfectly American in its character and style. Uh, all rock songs start together as a group, they end together as a group, and then what do we have in the middle? The solo. That's a perfect illustration of America. We get together to do things when we need to, but we never lose our individuality. And, and so what I found in Seven Events That Made America, where the movie came from, is a, a book I did, uh, and in the movie, is that Eastern Europeans were able to pick up that message of freedom even when they couldn't understand all the lyrics. So it was the, the form of the music that was messaging freedom to them, not that we were sending them pro-America music itself. Exactly right. And certainly there were songs like uh, Born in the USA, which is an anti-war song, but nobody would right. know that because you can't understand two-thirds of what Bruce Springsteen says anyway. And right. all the East Europeans were singing Born in the USA, and they wanted to be born in the USA. Missing Les out on the part about go kill the yellow man. Right. I, Leslie Mandoki said when we heard that, we wanted to be born in the USA. And, and so, it, yeah, the lyrics came along later, but, but first of all, it was the structure of the music. It's a music of freedom. So how did these ideas spread behind the Iron Curtain where they had so many controls on, on people and what they could do and consume? Well, the first and most important way is Voice of America Radio Free Europe. And uh, if you had a shortwave radio, which many people did behind the Iron Curtain, you could tune that to Voice of America, and these very powerful stations would beam it out. And almost anywhere short of Moscow, you could pick up uh, Voice of America. And uh, several of our people said it was very important that when you were done listening to Voice of America, you not only shut the radio off, but you turn the dial away from the station. So if the police came in and they look at the radio, they would, they would say, oh, you, you're listening to good state communist radio, not that evil Voice of America. The second way was smuggling. Smuggling of music through tour guides, through relatives. You could usually only get one song in, and usually it was a reel-to-reel -reel tape or later a cassette tape. It was hard to smuggle in uh, 33 and a third albums, right? Sure, like anything else in the black market that you're smuggling, you want small right. size to value ratio. But you could. You could get in 33 and a third, and one of our witnesses, a Romanian music collector named Gabriel Baum, actually his first American album was Parsley, Sage, Rosemary, and Time by Simon and Garfunkel. And he bought it uh, from a guy who, whose relative had smuggled it in, and he paid. You ready for this? 150 US dollars, wow. which was one month's salary. And our kids complain about paying 99 cents for an Amazon download, and he was willing to pay $150 for an album, but he said that was a going rate for all of them. Sure, I mean, we talk about supply and demand on this show a lot. If it's a product that's hard to get into Eastern Europe, but that people are really craving, this is what we'd expect. And, and there's, another, there's a great scene in the, in the movie with uh, Mother's Finest, uh, who played the same circuits that my band played. That's how we met, was playing some of the same circuits. And um, they were playing in East Berlin two weeks before the wall fell. And, and a guy gets on the bus, an officer, you know, and, and he's very stern looking and they think they're in trouble. And he tells the leader of Mother's Finest, to the back of the bus, you know, and oh no, am I going to get shot or whatever. He goes to the back of the bus, the guy's looking around like this, he goes, shh. And he pulls out a copy of one of their albums out of his jacket, and he says, you will autograph. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so how were, it, so we were blasting things in and things were smuggled in, but then what about the musicians themselves in Eastern Europe? Did they take this and, and run with it themselves then a too? Absolutely. Um, the Russians, which had, uh, who had less access to Voice of America, had a thriving underground rock and roll movement, and it's a little bit strange. In addition to rock, drums, guitar, bass, they would have a lot of lutes and mandolins. So, it, you know, it's sort of like uh, Dolly Parton meets rock and roll or something. And um, they had a guy named Boris Grabinchikov, who's considered to be the Bob Dylan of the Soviet Union, and he was constantly fighting with the authorities. As you get closer to the um, 
Iron Curtain itself, obviously not every country responded the same way. Some were harsher than others. East Germany is much, much harsher. But you get musicians picking up the American stuff. Just as an aside, in 1986, think about that. The Berlin Wall goes up 61, so 25 years later, the first Russian Soviet bands were allowed to tour the U.S., rock bands. So I got their album. Their mm -hmm. album's called Red Wave. It's a CD. You can get it on Amazon, right? Horrible. Really bad. But you can tell they were listening to American music. You know, they, it was like something you were, would have heard out of the 50s. So these bands began to copy Americans. They began making their own music. But many times they had to do, some, do something with a, a catch. And the catch was you had to get by the censors. So they developed a music form called the Rat Tail. The Rat Tail. The Rat Tail. It was made popular by journalists, but it gets its way into music. And the Rat Tail is when a writer writes a song with lyrics that are seen to be anti-American. Those horrible, those horrible Americans, capitalists, imperialists, but really all the listeners know they're talking about the Soviet Union. Hmm. So would they do it just as a just replace Soviet Union for America and that's who they're critiquing or would they also do it in an ironic way too? Well their, their main focus was was to say all right you know the Soviet Union's a bad bad group and this is largely coming from uh, Hungarians, Romanians uh, you're not you don't hear quite so many of those from Soviet artists. Now so other than gaming the system like that to get back by the censors there must have been other musicians back there who weren't so lucky did some of them either get punished for this or did they have to emigrate or what happened with them? Soviet Union, believe it or not, and I'm sure knowing the government as you do, you'll believe it, had an agency called the Ministry of Rock. Oh, hopefully not like the Ministry of Love. Yeah, well, you, it's, you can see a Jack Black movie in there someplace, right? But the Ministry of Rock actually controlled rock music and, and it would, it would uh, censor all, any lyrics it didn't want and it supported certain bands. So if you did pro-Soviet rock and roll, you got food subsidies, you got housing subsidies, you, you got a lot of goodies. If you didn't, you didn't get anything and you were likely to starve. If you wrote music that was too overtly anti-Soviet, you did worse than starve, you went to jail. Uh, Leslie Mandoki told us that they shut down his concerts. He was sure at least 17 times they just pl pulled the plug in the middle of a concert. And one of the cops said, Leslie, please stop doing this. He said, I've never heard one of your concerts till the end. I want to hear the end. <laughs> so this all happened and helped to contribute to the ideas that brought down the wall. Is there anything similar going on in battles for freedom around the world today? Well, rock music, of course, is the most popular music form anywhere in the world. As you travel around the world, it, you, you could go into a bar in Japan, you could go into a cafe in Malaya. No matter where you go, you're going to hear American rock and roll. Karaoke is American rock and roll, and even people who don't know what the words mean will be singing the American lyrics, right? Uh, mm -hmm. One example I got was that a guy was in, in a bike race uh, somewhere in uh, Africa, and he's on this hill, and he's working like crazy, and he comes to a a water stand around the corner on this hill and there's bananas and fruits and water bottles and the guy's got on a Van Halen t-shirt. You know, So rock and roll, American rock and roll is everywhere. It is moving into the Middle East and it's heavily sanctioned in, in places like Iran. Mm -hmm. But in our new movie, Other Walls to Fall, we have a heavy metal band from inside Tehran that smuggled us footage uh, of them playing and it's mostly against the government. It, did this play any role in the recent Arab Spring movement that was there as well? Absolutely. The music was key in the Arab Spring. As some of our witnesses said, you wouldn't have had two million people sit around that long without the music. And one of the guys who really kind of sparks the revolution is a young guitar player named Rami Assam who wrote the song that is basically the Get Rid of Mubarak song called, and I can't say it in Arabic, forgive me, but it's called Leave. And, and here's two million Egyptians singing along with him, Leave. Leave. Leave, leave, you know, and, and he did. Well, that's great. Well, thank you very much for joining us today and, and sharing all of this. Sure. On the first half of today's show, we were fortunate to be able to visit with Dr. Ron Paul. Through his two presidential campaigns, he's probably done more than anybody else in recent years to introduce many Americans, particularly young Americans, to the ideas about the importance of free markets and individual liberty. Then on the second half of the show, we learned how rock and roll music spread ideas of freedom behind the Iron Curtain and how it's also doing it around the world today. Many forces shape the type of government that we live under. 
Clearly, though, one important one is the ideas that the population in general holds. It's my hope that this show can play at least some small part in spreading better understanding of how free markets work around the population here in the United States. We'll see you next time.